Sorry, this is just setting it up. All right, I think we are good to go. So um, welcome everyone um, to our live poetry event on behalf of U City Library with Herb Arts tonight. We all thank you for joining us. My name is Lindsay Beckman. I am a, a reference librarian with University City Public Library. Um, and I just have a few topics to cover right before we get started. So. First off, this program is part of Lift Every Voice, Why African American Poetry Matters, a national public humanities initiative of Library of America, presented in partnership with the Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture, with generous support from the National Endowment for the Humanities, the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, and Emerson Collective. Library of America also has a brand new anthology out uh, entitled African American Poetry, 250 Years of Struggle and Song, which you can check out from the library. Uh, we would also like to invite you to another uh, poetry event at the beginning of November as part of this Lift Every Voice series. On Monday, November 2nd at 7 p.m., that's the eve of election day, uh, we will host a community Zoom discussion with poet and activist uh, Dr. Treasure Shields Redmond. Um, this discussion will center around the concept of the freedom struggle, uh, which is how poetry and activism inform each other in this rich tradition of African-American poetry. And it will center around three specific poems uh, that are found in our project reader. Um, that information can be found on our website, ucitylibrary.org under the adult services page. And uh, we also invite anyone who feels so inspired if they have um, some sort of creative reaction to this topic or the poems, uh, if they want to write a poem, maybe paint something or even record something on video for us, you can submit it on that website um, for us to have as part of our discussion. So we're very excited about that as well. Um, but without further ado, I would now like to introduce you to MK Stahl. About Herb Arts and the poets we have here with us tonight. All right, thank you very much. We do appreciate being here and working with University City Library on this very important initiative. So with that said, we have some wonderful poets who are here, some excellent poets, as a matter of fact. And we're going to start with Kaylin. She is a two-time Brave New Voices uh, champion. She's also a recent high school graduate. She's out here doing her thing and all the things that she might be doing, right? So followed by Grace. Then we'll have Sahara. Grace, who is a now of a Brave New Voices Youth Poetry Slam champion. And she was featured with the National Book Festival, uh, which happened uh, just last week, I believe. So she was featured there. She was a featured voice uh, representing youth poetry, particularly youth poetry slam um, throughout the country. So it was excellent that she was able to not only represent all of the country, but also in particular St. Louis. So that's always good. After her, we'll have Sahara Sister Souls, who is a poet, a playwright, actress. Uh, she also works for the, uh, the St. Louis Public Library. Uh, that's, uh, that's part of how she spends her time and what she does. Uh, but in addition to what she, what she does as an artist and all the work that she does as a visual artist and as a poet, we're glad that she can be a part of it. And then to kind of close us out will be Gregory Maurice. Uh, he's a poet, a playwright. Uh, he's done some acting. He does about everything. So, so we're glad to be, uh, have a roster of, of, of Black poets uh, from throughout the diaspora who can represent and send their voices forward in this most important moment when we need to hear from Black artists. And Black artists have always offered their voices in moments like these. And so to kind of start us off, we want to uh, make space for 
Kaylin. So thank you, Kaylin, for being a part of it. Thank you. Okay, so I guess I'm just gonna jump right into it. I'm Kaylin. I've been a poet for like three years. So here we go. I bow my head and bend my knees at the bed of the altar, offering myself to repent for my sins. Holy water, the milk spoon, the milk spoon fed to me since infancy. The pastor who sprinkled the salvation liquid across my forehead, the same father who birthed me, learned my ABCs from the teachings of the holy book. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. God saw that light was good and he separated the light from the darkness. Light, one of the factors that separates my father and I, his skin fallen upon the darker side, separate division, skin on the darker side, preaches the light separates the light from the dark. I am light. And yet the product of my mind is considered dark. Dark thoughts that can only be described as one thing, the devil forced to fight against my own mind. I am light, my mind is dark, divided. He preaches God's truth. I am described as a punishment, result of sin, prescribed to psychotherapy. The gears in my mind never seem to allow the hands of the clock to arrive at the right time. Something's off. Mental illness passed down from father to daughter, his burden to bear, his burden to share with me, and yet I feel it is a weight I am forced to carry on my own. My sickness disregarded in my own home, it's not real, it's not real, don't matter what you feel. In the Black community, it's only real if you can see it. Place more emphasis on preparing me for the afterlife when I'm barely coping with my current life, yet I am told to pray to a God I can't see. A God who seems to punish me for the crimes of man because I feel every single thing. Can't think straight because every phrase I hear is replayed. Sometimes I wish it would all go away, that I could get rid of the pain. And yet pain is how I cope, burn my skin, not with the rope tightened around my neck with the edge of a blade heated. I pressed it against my face, forcing myself to feel something other than pain by inflicting self-pain. I am light, like the light glowed when I burned myself with the iron. I am light, like my sickness was so brightly broadcast to my parents, and yet it was still ignored. I am light, like the only thing I thought would help was ending my own life. I am light, I am light, I am light. And yet I craved for the darkness of my eyes fluttering shut as I beckoned my last breath. I am light. When the shadows I see I'm told aren't real, schizophrenia, bipolar, anxiety, depression labeled as an illness, a disease or period of sickness affecting the body or mind, bad, dark. My mere everyday condition described as sick, unwell, not in good health. God saw that the light was good and he separated the light from the darkness. I'm light and yet elements of me are dark. A darkness I cannot separate, a darkness he created. God punished the original daughter Eve and I can't help but feel like he punished me. Okay, that's the first one. On to the next one. Black rage is founded on two thirds of person, rapings and beatings and suffering that worsens. Black human packages tied up with strings. Black rage can come from all these kinds of things. I taught myself to sing in a manner that would make bitter truths easy to swallow sang in a voice that better blended with their sound, disregarded any slang or turn or phrase that could be affiliated with my race. I straightened my hair for auditions wrapped in a visibility cloak around my color. I staged a reality in which I was like them because isn't staging what they do best because I recalled the five black boys they cast in a play at Central Park. The police directed them into cuffs, photographed their mugshots and framed them typecast for a role without even asking for a script. Unfortunately for them, the role was antagonist. The only role real life black folks book, booking list arc is the imitation of life, which is why I'm not surprised they only cast me to belt runs at the end. Running is what white folks taught us to do best because God knows we'll get punished for standing still. Michael Brown was still and he was granted a starring feature for it in the remake of the cult classic film initially entitled Samuel or Sandra or Trayvon or Freddie. If you ask me, that film has been made too many times. So why does it keep getting callbacks? Why is this song continuously replies? My morning song is the only song I feel like singing lately. Brothers and sisters getting slain in the streets on a daily, but casting directors don't want to hear that. To them, every show has blind casting. They don't see color because all lives matter, especially if you're white. It's a good thing I don't want their role anymore. The role that tried to make me hate myself with no amount of scrubbing or pretending can shake my color. So I will act out the part of activist advocate, recite resistance to my opposition, tell the history they tried to ignore, perform 
no reform the system that allows found footage horror films to play across social media screens black black man murdered by a cop on his knee black girl murdered while in her house asleep black child shot for playing with a toy black man lynched while running but we can't run from this. We can't act our way out of the part they cast us in, but we can dismantle their racist system, take back the country that was built on our backs. So march to you can't no more for Ahmad and yell so loud they have no choice but to hear you for Brianna and petition till your fingers bleed for George and laugh and cry and sing and live because we deserve to live. We deserve to live. We deserve to live. So stop killing us. Being a black girl with mental health issues is a lot like being a black girl who chooses to wear her naturally kinky hair. And I can relate to both of those things. And no, my hair doesn't directly apply to my brain, even though it covers, but people only pay attention to it when it's bad. I mean, the days when my twist out looks awful and my hair is too thick to fit in my usual high poof, and I have no time to change it because my mom's in the doorway tapping her foot impatiently. Those days when people gawk at me in the hallway like my hair and untamed beast they don't like the sight of. Like people don't like the sight of my bad days and breakdowns, so they turn their heads and mutter opinions on my conditions. One day, a boy called me a B-word because I didn't return his smile where he didn't know that some smiles have sharp teeth and some shadows can't be seen by people who aren't me. Sometimes I don't see what's really there. They never see how much effort I put in my hair when I stay up late to make sure my hair is slicked back and my edges are laid. Today, I spent approximately two hours and 30 minutes on my hair. A week ago, I had a wash day. Not a minute, not an hour, but a day trying to cleanse the product buildup because that's how it starts the buildup stuff that rolls off another shoulder, chips off of mine till it gets to the point where I can't open my eyes because I can't find the strength or the willingness or the inspiration to get up. So I lay there. Like my hair stays flat even when I plead for volume and coops up when I want it to lay there. My mind is my own worst enemy. And when I beg it to do one thing, it does another. Okay, and this is my last one. Millie and Christine McCoy, two women strung together, their spines stitched together, created a blended quilt of their bodies, Millie and Christine. Siamese, conjoined twins born in 1851, died in 1912, I'm the direct descendant of a tree whose roots were twisted together in agony, kidnapped and stolen from their family. They were sold into the circus. At 10 months old, instead of being displayed for their adorable manner, they were deemed freaks of nature. They mastered the art of trapeze, learned to use their voices to swing between enslavement and employment, called the eighth wonder of the world, screwed eight times over slave, Siamese, specimens, curiosities, cretins, creatures, and black and female and freak fearfully and wonderfully made, the world couldn't fathom their excellence. So they exploited it. Paraded around a freak show, getting tangled in the tightrope more chains, their freedom was a business transaction. So Purvis sold to Bauer and Bauer sold to Smith. They ended up a product of Barnum who would go on to be praised as a hero in 2017. The greatest showman got famous for that song, This Is Me. I'm not scared to be seen. I make no apologies. This is me. The living blood of Millie and Christine, the descendant whose mouth was roped shut, strung up my ancestors like marionette dolls, stuffed my mountain with cotton like they picked, prevented me from telling their story by cutting off any recollection that might form a coherent connection between them and I. Conjoined twins severed from my memory, erased from your textbooks, unless you're referring to racial slurs. For once, I don't mean the word nigger. Siamese is the only bridge between them and I, and if they weren't a product or a puppet, even their names would remain a foreign taste on my bleached tongue. Millie and Christine are more than a story to be brushed past, more than a song that dances over the cruelty of Barnum, but women, one woman with two voices singing one song of togetherness and isolation, of triumph and strength in the five languages they were fluent in. They left field songs to sing for Queen Victoria, exchanged chains for diamond embellished bracelets, even in death they demonstrated strength. Millie died 12 hours before her sister Christine. She carried the both of them around for half a day, but even with all of their fame, why were they buried in an unmarked grave? Why must my ancestors remain a mystery? Why, even after hearing this poem, will you forget them? Why did I have to learn about them through Google searches and white authors? Because stories like theirs are always being pushed on the back burner, being engulfed in flames before ever seeing the light of day. But I will be the voice for the voiceless and utter their story until my breath runs out because I refuse to let another story of Black women fade into oblivion like it always seems to happen now. 
because it happened to them and this poem is resurrecting them. May they never be left dead again. I'm them and they are me. So I will scream their names until it rings in my ears and fails to leave your memory, Millie and Christine. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Dope. Thank you. Thank you. So, all right. So I think next up we have another person that was a teammate of Kaylin's uh, on this past summer's team. She was awesome um, and she did her thing. She was definitely dropping some incredible works. And then she was recently honored to be a part of the National Book Festival, which is sponsored by the Library of Congress or presented by the Library of Congress. So uh, without further ado, please welcome Grace. Hi, I'm Grace. It's an honor to be here. Um, I'll be spitting four pieces. The first one is called Manifestations, a letter to my grandmother. Show, show. Every time I try to tell you how much I love you, the words get lost in my refusal to condemn the colonizers. You see, I do love you, grandmother. So much so that I'm willing to admit that you were right. That I did cut the chains that link me to my culture, but I didn't realize it until I went to a friend's house for dinner last night. His walls were white as the lies his grandfather taught him to hide behind and his parents thought themselves saviors. Preached about appropriation, but called it discovery grandmother. They told me of manifest destiny, of how their forefathers taught them to pull themselves up by the bootstraps, how they could teach me. They must not have known that I am granddaughter of a culture they couldn't cage of a woman with skin the color of land she fought tooth and nail for, but how could they? When every day I watch as they make my last name more palatable, pretzel it around their tongues as if Ruo cannot go down without being regurgitated, as if it bitters the backs of their throats, his parents told me in order to make it to the top, I'm to let go of everything keeping me on the ground, like Yokoyo. It's as if English is the only key into this land of the free and they said I can't afford to be locked out. That I'm to speak this language as if it were the one I was born into. They must not have known that I am daughter of a mother tongue unmuted, but how could they? When each morning I indulge in the sin that is this language, douse my tongue in English before I leave the house and when I come back home, I scrub it off. Try to find scattered bits of Gekoyo, place them on the tip of my tongue, I call it my act of repentance. Try not to think about how if you could hear me, you'd tell me that my tongue is no longer pure. That because I've decided to carry myself as if my culture has nothing to do with my identity, then maybe I've given what's left of my sense to pay for my American dream, and you're right. This country... It has everything there is to offer, and I'd be damned if I didn't take advantage. See, his parents could teach me to be American as the apple pie we had for dessert. His father cut into it with a hunting knife. Told me it's been in his family for generations, and I wondered how many of my people breathe their last by this blade. And your voice beckoned me to run, but in a language I've been taught to forget. See, this country has everything there is to offer but it feels like the only thing it wants to give me is amnesia. It does not want me to realize that my destiny is to manifest everything their grandfathers taught them to forget. I, with skin the color of land you fought tooth and nail for, am nothing if not a testament to your victory. May they look at me and see you. May I never again disregard the desecration of my culture. May my tongue tell of everything they failed to omit. I. I'm a manifestation of everything they dare disregard and I will make it so that they never forget. And this next piece is called Anchors. Emmett was 14 when whistling made him immortal. It's like he put his lips together to say, God, this isn't what I wish, but if it be your will, let it. So men beat him blue. Made him carry his cotton gin cross to Calvary, Mississippi, beat him bloody, broke his beautiful black skin. Was never meant to be saved. Never meant to be savior and 
Maybe that's why they never told us of a bronze skin Jesus. Didn't want us to know the skin be beautiful, be heavenly, be holy, only want to fill it with holes. I heard they crucified Emmett with barbed wire, tied the cotton gin to his neck and made him an anchor, made him bear the weight of his black, but they watched him drown. Did his mama know he'd be immortal? That his name would live on every tongue that came after? Jesus was 33 when miracles made him immortal. Knew his time was coming, he said, God, this isn't what I wish, but if it be your will, let it. So men beat him blue, made him carry his cross to Calvary, beat him bloody, broke his beautiful, I heard they crucified him. Nailed him to the cross, made him bear the weight of his black or they watched him die. Did his mama know he'd be immortal? That his name would live on every tongue that came after. That must be what it takes. Black boy beaten beyond recognition, world carries on. Black boy bleeds onto death pavement, world carries on. Black boy dead, world stops. My third piece is called Alternate Heaven after Denez Smith. I dream of a place in which the only reason the, the name Jim Crow rings a bell is because he's the choir director. Reminds us that even in his world, every one of our voices is to be lifted. Those heavens ring with our harmonies. Meanwhile, I live in a place where his name is the last nail in the doorway, shutting colored people out from their God-given rights. Makai, black boy almost turned Twitter hashtag, made to explain why buying breakfast wasn't a threat. Black and unarmed must be crime of the century. Officers told him he looked like a prior suspect, he said. At least I got out with my life, look at Amadou. Cannot believe there's such a thing in which the, co the color of my skin is synonymous with unworthy. A world in which if I choose to sit at the table instead of, mm, I'm sorry, instead of toil in the kitchen, I'm to scrape the untidiness out of my hair because sophistication and this crown are not cut from the same cloth when hit there. Our sisters grow up believing they're just as beautiful as the girls they see on television. Screens spill over with amber-colored girls whose elegance grows out of their scalps and coils. Their bodies ain't made to be covered up when uncles come over, our brothers grow up. There, street lights are not soothsayers bidding us beware of nightfall. A bullet's final resting place is not a black boy's head. Corner store and corner's office aren't interchangeable, but here, trigger happy hands thought my cousin a weapon so they held him by the neck. His mother could not breathe life back into him, so she stretched her voice across the lands, yearning that his name not be forgotten. Here, our fathers are leaves. With us only for a season, they must be destined to chase the wind. But there, they stay. Because they're so rooted in their history, they withstand the winds of inferiority. Our mothers are not beacons of grief there not weighed down by the gravestones of Twitter hashtag children. They're singing in the morning, lets us know the sun rises there. I know that every time, I, I'm sorry, I know that every time a bloodthirsty Thursday afternoon swallows us whole, that is where we wind up. The peace our grandmothers pray we rest in and someday we will be together at peace. And my last piece is called Of Icarus and the Sun. I picked the last strand of him out of my hair just for him to call. Tell me he's written something new about me. About two girls, actually, that he tried so carefully to hide behind metaphors, one being the string of a kite, keeps him grounded, reminds him where home is, the other is the kite, keeps him lifted, shows him what it could be like to fly. I tell him he sounds like Icarus. Knows he can't fly too close to the sun. Knows that's exactly where I'll take him and make him feel nothing but wildfires. I guess he's smart because unlike Icarus, he decides to stay near the water. Says it's probably what's best, that the water is predictable. Sun tells him I've never known water to be predictable. Don't they name the most catastrophic hurricanes after women? I mean. If you're gonna play with something that's not good for you, wouldn't you rather play with fire? He stops me in my flames, 
starts distracting me with more metaphors, says the sun's beauty can't be put into words, though I smile because I am the sun and I can't be put into words. But then I frown because he still wrote about two girls. So who is the water? Who is this other girl and why does he hide her behind metaphors? Is it because she keeps your heart at bay? Is it cause you look at her and know where home is, but what is a home if it's always cold? Especially if I can keep you warm in this one, look at me. Know this is where your life can begin. Let me be your son. Be the reason you know it's okay to wake up in the morning. Be the glory you bask in on a hot summer's day. Before I get too lost in the metaphor, Icarus cuts me off. Says it isn't that serious. I frown because he's Icarus, but in my head I smile because maybe it's okay for him to be completely unsure about whether he should go for a swim or take a walk in the sunshine. But honestly, I think he should scratch this, rewrite the poem, or maybe not mention me in the first place because the sun isn't what's best for him. Maybe it's easier to drown than burn. See, the story of Icarus is not a poem, but for some reason, he's my favorite one. I mean, wouldn't you want to fly? Maybe Icarus wasn't shit. To think he could have both sun and water without being burnt alive or swallowed whole. I don't want to be his favorite part of a poem. Don't want him taking in only parts of me. I am the poem. You know what? I should get off the phone. Should leave him there sitting cold, wet, and shivering with nothing but a lifeless piece of string. And fuck your poem. Because you need to revise it. Thank you. Thank you, Grace. Uh, always with the fire. I uh, was so glad that she was able to be a part of the team this year. She was excellent. Uh, and also just a reminder, we're gonna actually open up the Youth Poet Laureate competition for any young poets who are interested. Uh, it'll happen this month. Uh, we'll start putting out notices about it as soon as it's online and live. Uh, but that's something that will be happening later on this month. Uh, up next, and really without further ado, uh, we have somebody who's a, a poet, a playwright, actress. She is the co-director of the, the St. Louis Poetry Slam. Uh, she has coached youth poetry and has been a part of the two championship teams that we have for youth poetry in St. Louis. Uh, so please welcome Sahara Sister Souls. I have heard it all. Sarah, Savannah, Salili, Safari, Sister Soldier, Soul Sister, and Destiny. Yeah, that last one was a stretch, but I guess they're all easier to remember than Sahara's Sister Soul. See, Massa liked to snatch names from native tongues and call us whatever was easier to remember. And most days people don't even try, so I stopped correcting them but it was freshman year on my white campus. And my name was international. My French a little bit too much like students from Rwanda and Ghana, like immigrant or refugees, Jemapel, Sahara. And a friend finally asked me how one of my names said, and I had to ask my mama, embarrassed that I kept trying to duck and dodge my name like we ain't grow up together. Like we ain't end up at the back of the line at the same time, had to learn to pronounce my birthright, how it's supposed to sound. I mean, how proud should I be of a name people think I stole from a country my people were stolen from? Sahara isn't a cool name I thought would heal the trauma of my ancestors. Sahara is American, is African American. Her mother didn't know of nothing about rolling no arbor. So Sahara isn't my name unless you know its origin, unless your tongue has tasted another language. My name is Sahara, Sahara like the desert. No, I'm not from Africa. No, I did not change my name. No, you cannot call me something else. My name is Sahara Olivia Lysandra Scott. S-O-L-S, -S, Souls, isn't a cool poet name. I thought of one day. It was the only way a black mother could protect her child in case I was taken. She taught me to write S-O-S -S on mirrors, tucking the L so she could find me. And when I was lost in the system, nothing but a number on social workers' folders, I found myself a sister amongst long lost girls. See, sisters that ran from the weighted names of their families as group homes shuffled us around like criminals because having convicts as parents ain't a good namesake. So I figured if God made us all family, then I'm your sister for life. 
And yes, my name is a mouthful. I will not shorten it for you to make it easier for you to swallow. See, I'm the girl from the hood with the name so exotic. I'm the professional in your office with the name so exotic. I'm so exotic, I'm nearly extinct. I'm the last Scott to carry my family name that reaches all the way back to the freed slave Booker T. Scott and then the trail becomes history, past and bedtime stories and in poems. And isn't it funny how a name becomes freedom etched on paper? So if my name happens to find your lips, call me Sahara, call me Sahara Sister Souls, call me Souls, S-O-L-S, -S, or don't call me at all. So that's that first piece. And then switch it up a little bit and do this little limerick. Okay, it's not a limerick, but it's a poem. <clears throat> Limbs hanging out of windows, toes curling over the dash, slobber hitting the velvet seats. It was my mama, the road, and I. Stopping at suspect diners, eating till belly swole, swerving, twisting, singing, spotting a carnal bird. It was my mama, the road, and I. Picking up a stranger, making all new types of friends, we just two little ladies heading down south again. It was my mama, the road, and I. Inhaling the sycamores, picking sunflowers, spitting seeds, spine laughing, dancing, cows chewing what they need. It was my mama, the road, and I. Problems left in cornfields, worries drops like litter in the road. We don't pollute our attitudes no matter how bad a day goes. For each bad, there's always good. The sun will shine on summer, traveling on and on, just my mama, the road, and I. See, my mama cleans our history in a bowl of water, calls them chitlins. Moo moo spread wide like legs, almost like an emblem of her childhood. This trance transports her back to fridges being cool pools of lake water, of picking cottons that bite your hands. And I watch the blood pool round her fingers, the same water, cleaning our food, family of butchers. Cause that's what master had us do, butcher ourselves. Like we all know no matter, mouths closed and legs spread, pass it down to my mama. Washing memories, wasn't that years ago, mama? The kitchen hot, like her burning eyes boring into mine. History ain't but a generation away. Mama cried when a black man won, and she was there when a black man died. Freedom tastes like cooking slave food just cause you're hungry. Slathering it in hot sauce so you can taste the lashes. Don't recognize the flavor of injustice. Cook up some chitlins that taste like folk tales made up stories that black folks tell tall cooking smells like knowledge boiling of lineage they wanted us to forget it is prepared so we can carry it in our bellies our story that's that piece a little history a little history there um this one is a little bit newer with something a little bit older this is about being nice. The thing about being nice is that people often mistake your smile for weakness. They see your kindness as permission to have you messed up. And I'm the nicest. I got pleasantries that surpass most peasants. Please, this isn't to be confused with me. Being naive, best believe I know disrespect when I see it. Because respectful, I be it, albeit I exude pettiness when I need to, it would be a mistake to call me rude. It's politeness I exude, and it's not an excuse to take advantage. I'm a delightful bandit, meaning that if you have the audacity to come at me incorrect, well, let's just say I'm a meticulous to a fault. I keep my hood girl in a vault, and the combination ticks every time you happen to tick me off, so try me. Someone tried to ignite my angry Black woman today put the roll in my neck and the hiss in my teeth. How dare I defy my nature with a curl of these full luscious rebellions, deny flared bull nostrils, meaning that I will correct you without being agreeable. We'll let you know that I still have the floor, will curtly fill the room with my presence and will not ask your permission. There are shadows that lurk in the corners of women that have smudged out of the full picture and I don't fit that dark image, but my delightfulness makes me more than a mere accessory. My brownness is more than a token that affirms your institution. I will not ask for forgiveness for doing what I do better than you. 
I learned your rules and flipped them on the head to my advantage. I will climb without code switching to make you comfortable. That's what my mama scrubbed my tongue for. Every moment with me is so satisfying. You wonder why I won't acknowledge your tears. How I bury your insecurities with my confidence. See, I have an S on my chest and they call it success, but I call it strength. God has always put me to the test and I've done my best. That's why they say I'm strong. Sing a song of salacious soliloquies and you'll know me spiritually. Spinning souls into submission is my commission, but I ain't got to talk permission unless, you know, I get permission. It's not just my adrenaline that's got me lifting the world on my shoulders. It's because I've walked through the fires and been through the smolders. Now I'm bolder, older, and my pen is colder. See, I look in the mirror and I see my shiro. Because she rose like a she rose from a garden of mud and the crud I've gotten rid of will surprise you. Stunning sonnets surround souls like spring Spring breeze sees the sisters that spit spontaneous stanzas that command us to stand. They call me Sahara, superhero and superstar. No, silly similes don't surmise me, but they do say I'm a spirit only living strong. So that's that piece. And then since I was talking about smiling, I want to end on a positive note, you guys. So we're going to smile our way out. As you can tell, I like smiling. <laughs> Got my teeth cleaned recently. Woo. All right. So they keep asking about my smile. Now, before I start, this is not about the resting bee face. Mm -mm. This is actually about smiling, about how smiles are like telling all your trauma, not today, baby. Or like crescent moons uh, on display right beneath your nose and everyone questions it. I mean, what she got to be so happy about? Why her teeth keep gleaming like that, like her toothpaste done hit all the plaque. Like her Listerine done left her lips stuck in an upward like motion like maybe her braids too tight or her locks too tight and she can't help but smile, but she gonna cry soon. But maybe someone could actually be happy. I mean, it's a crazy concept, but maybe I woke up on the right side of the bed and the sun was shining or like the rain moisturized my hair right. And hell, like maybe I talked to God this morning and his response were raised to charge my melanin. So I got to take that vitamin D today. And whatever disaster was going to happen, yes, my, and I get it. I shouldn't have laughed when I nearly bit it. That trip on the sidewalk was less than humorous, but the laugh made my grin grow like branches that puts out insecurities. And optimism is the ugly stepsister, the slipper of joy that will never quite fit, but my feet slip right on into positivity. And it's so taboo that if a cup of it was right in front of most of us, we would never swallow because we get used to getting burns. And I'm tired of scorching my own throat. And I'm not saying everything is perfect. Just that I've outgrown negativity that clings to you like summer heat so I can't help but feel uncomfortable when it's around me, that affirmations are like mantras now. So every time I hear no, I say, I can do anything. Every time someone tells me that they don't love me enough, I say, I deserve everything. And every time I hear you're too much this and not enough of that, I say, I love me, period. See, confidence is what most people have forgotten the Garden of Eden was supposed to be before snakes in the grass convinced us to be ashamed. So I wear my smile boldly. True story. I got a raise and a 10-day eviction in the same day. It was the travesty. My jeans felt more like the time spent in the gym the day before wasn't worth it. So I'm probably wearing leggings to work again today and tomorrow and the next day. And I still forget to trust that everything will be okay. So here I am thinking I'm crushing adulthood. And actually I was because I didn't have to sleep on a metal park bench last night or wait in the line at a shelter that they closed, or go to a pantry for dinner, or borrow a friend's bed or couch or money without paying them back, you know? <laughs> and I could for once give instead of take, and it may seem trivial, that the eviction notice looming on my dinner table and I laughed because I got a freaking raise today and it may seem trivial that I put my name on this lease and I pull the cry out of my throat and turn it into this smiling thing. But being the first one to graduate from high school and college means something, even if it doesn't mean anything to the nice rental office, that the hood and educated revolts in my blood are two forces that don't like to exist in the same body, but remind me that I know what feeling locked in is like. So on the low days where I can't seem to summon the good, I channel my Rastafarian spirit. Don't worry, 
about a thing. Every little thing is going to be all right. And then I feel my let my lips dancing into this gleaming thing that takes away the darkness and pushes into light. And all you have to do is smile. Yay. So be positive, you guys. I know things are rough and hard, but it's however you take it. Let it come to you. Let it be what it is. Thank you so much for having me today. And if you guys want to follow me on social media, it's Sister Souls, S-I-S-T-A-S-O-L-S. Peace out. Bye. Thank you again, Sahara Sister Souls. Again, one of the top, one of the dopest, one of the best poets we have here in St. Louis. She has so much to offer, so many gifts. So next up, we got Gregory Maurice. Gregory Maurice, will, uh, he's a poet. He's a, he's a playwright. Uh, he, is, uh, he does so many things. So Greg is going to bless us with uh, three poems to close us on out. So thank you, Greg. And... The floor and the mic is yours. What's going on? Um, can you hear me? Okay. Yep, I can hear you. Yep. All right, uh, man. Appreciate you uh, bringing me on for tonight. Uh, I'm gonna just bless, bless you guys with a few pieces. Um, this first piece is called "We Don't Know How Hip Hop Sounds Anymore." We don't know how hip hop sounds anymore. No one ever told us the hip hop was created from the strains of a woman's voice, her vocals. Vocally vibrate, vibrantly. these hymns would be the capsules where beats come to be. The feet of hip hop is rooted in Negro spirituals. The foundation is layered in Christianity, slavery, and lyrics, the same lyrics that would liberate once liberated. These lyrics would need to be drunk on the keynotes of corn whiskey. Hip hop is two notches from ragtime. The sound of it can be heard, but no one ever told us that the sound of it can be seen. In the eyes of a 70-year-old man, his hands play younger, scratching across strings stained with old age, something like a DJ, scratching a needle on a record. He is like a DJ scratching across notes. And you can see cotton growing on his fingertips. He has been picking as long as he's been picking play, hip-hop play, with a limp in each note, swaying side to side, his feet measuring the beat. Hip-hop has always had a poetic rhythm. The bass in his voice does more than sing. It beats boom, 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 boom. Hip hop is wrapped in a cloth of Mississippi blues, molded in the dirt floors of shacks where mama would place an apron around her hip to compose a ballad of soul food during the day. At night, she would reach into her oak wooden chest, pulling out a handmade red dress smelling of roses and mothballs. She gets ready to turn her shack of a home into a house party. Snap, clap. Break dance into Louis Armstrong scatting hip hop or the lyrics that come out of a horn, reincarnated in the souls of funk, molded into a 45 record, a sheet of plastic noise knocking on the door to be let in. Hip hop has always found a place to call home. But no one ever told us that a young boy from the Bronx walked to school traveling on Bruce Street, stuck on hope and being forgotten every day he itches to get back home at night. He would reach into his oak wooden closet pulling out a red crate smelling of Motown and James Brown, the music his parents grew up on, now grows on him while he breaks down each song on every beat to get the neighborhood to clap, snap, and break dance to a style of music that was never new. Hip hop is a traveler picking up new items to put on its wardrobe, experiencing its writing and its journals. Can you see hip hop was born in the South, bottle fed on real milk? Educated in Harlem and lived in the Bronx. Hip hop stepped into a world of bars and battles on street corners, became an activist, living on the lips of a woman. That's that first piece. Uh, we don't know how hip hop sounds anymore. Um, I'll go to an another piece. Uh, it's titled Homeless. It's more of a short story um dealing with a real experience i had with a homeless man so here we go it was seven years ago i worked at bush stadium i loved helping customers just hated the other things like specifically the counting down of the cash register the folding of shirts the organizing of miscellaneous items like magnets mini bats and magazines night games that didn't end at the bottom of the night repetitive sayings like welcome to the Cartners team store is there anything particular i can help you find did you place your order for pickup? 
What size do you need? Did you find everything okay? Would you like your receipt in the bag with you all done with a smile and standing for 10 hours? I finished my night shift that night. Clocked out of work and started to see what seemed like a hike half a mile to the nearest bus station. I could smell midnight air. Every step reminded me of my bed. The soles of my feet stung as if the streets were paved with thorns. I tiptoed, danced across the bricks, my body limp. The whole half a mile there, all I wanted to do was rest. I saw a bench that has held a thousand of tired bodies. I rested my feet, I placed my hands in my pockets and I listened to the orchestras of the bus motors. I tuned out the street cars that passed by and I waited. Closed my eyes to the colors of downtown and I thought this is me going home, not clocking back in to work until tomorrow, until I heard a deep, raspy, but calm, eager voice. Young fella, can you push me across the street to the hotel so I can use the bathroom? My eyes opened with an attitude. I stared with silence the hotel across the street. I said with a frown on my face, calculating the distance and time it would take for us to get back to the bus on time, a homeless man stood in front of me. Skin ashy copper, rough wrinkles etched his face like cracked streets after winter, his beard gray and dirty hands marked with dirt spots. I just wasn't sure when the last time he washed his hands. I could hear my great uncle say, cleanliness is next to godliness. A man should be clean. I could see he's done more overnight shifts than me. He said, humped in his wheelchair with a St. Louis ball cap on that seemed better days. He looked just like those Crockman fans I helped. His shoes unstitched from the soles like a bird's nest loose from a tree. The stare he gave me was filled with hope, but knew it wasn't guaranteed. I wanted to say no at first, but I said sure with a frowning face. Unsure if me helping would be enough thinking of my uncle. He once said, if a man has two hands, he can do the work. I lifted my feet, clocked back in to work. This won't show up on my check as overtime. I told him, I can take you to the front entrance of the hotel. He told me, can you push me to the bathroom entrance? I waited for him to be done every minute, lifting my coat sleeve to check my watch. After 15 minutes, he comes out and then he says, can you take me to get a cup of coffee at the bar? Embarrassment crawled on my face, pushing this homeless man around the legs of hotel patrons, squeezing between stools. I pondered how this hotel bar should be more wheelchair accessible. He asked the bartender, can I get a cup of coffee, black, no cream, one chicken cube? He reaches down and pulls off his right shoe, pulls out change, chains that's been there all day, chains buried at the bottom of his sock. White patrons just look at him and then they look at me. I just stare with silence. He didn't have enough for a dollar eighty cup of coffee. The bartender announced, can anybody get this man a cup of coffee? A white man at the bar pissed in one dollar coffee in hand, pushed him between the traffic of onlookers and bar stools. The midnight coffee strangled between his fingers for two sips. And then he muttered, this coffee ain't no good. I don't want it. I wondered maybe he just wanted to remember how the feeling of warmth felt traveling between his hands, knocking the winter chill from beneath his soul, from beneath his pores. Before he could exit, he muttered one last request. Can you help me ask these white people if they can get me a hotel room for tonight? His voice filled with hope, but knew it wasn't guaranteed. I could hear my father say, you can't depend on random people to help you. Everyone we asked that night gave him a stare and shook their heads, no, we can't help you, they said. After the fifth no, he locked his black hands together, folding them as a, uh, as a final signal that we should leave. We returned to the bus and I realized how I didn't help him. This man, homeless, a customer, a Cartman's fan, as he drifts and dreams about home after working the street stained with judgment, how I never asked him, is there anything particular I can help you with? Would you like your coffee, water, or food? When would you like to come pick up some new shoes? What size hotel room would you like for tonight? Would you like your money in the bag or in your hand? Is everything okay? I never asked him what his name was, just the memory. A man that reflected struggle but demonstrated strength. This encounter showed me that, this encounter showed me all that was told to me as a young man that even though he was homeless, I could see him striving to be independent. He held 
courage in his heart to ask for assistance, even though people told him no, he still showed persistence to ask again. I never saw shame on his face, just pride. I respected his efforts for him to be vulnerable and not to worry about people looking down on him. What I learned that night, as a man, it's okay. We boarded the bus, and as the bus pulled up to my stop, the homeless man said, thank you for helping me, young man. And I said, you're welcome. So that's that short story uh, called Homeless. Um, the next piece, um, it's called Excuse Me. And on the last piece, uh, once again, thank you for bringing me on. Um, excuse me, what do you see? How do I look? What do you think of when you stare? Look close, stare hard, my eyes will not straggle past you. I will not blink, know of my body rules of your presence, come closer. I know I'm black. Tar, trash, dirty, sambo, ape to you, three-fifths of a man, property going free. Come closer. Don't you see a human body or do you see a shadow outside the door? Painted American red with words etched on the outside from a distance, it resembles scratches. Up close, it reads like scriptures. Scriptures that tell a story how the Constitution burned beneath our feet. The smoke wasn't great, it was white, choked us out of privilege. After we helped build, help grow, help form the skeletons of white America, can you see the blood dripping from the American flag? The same blood which dyed the cotton that sticks together those Republican ties. Do you want us to burn forever? But we don't die so easy. Our hearts won't let us lose the only life that we do have. Though our hearts are wrapped in the warm blood of bandages and heavy with hurt, how come you never seem to have sympathy? How come you never want us to have empathy? Do you, but do every, but do you, but do everything for us to feel sorrow, Lakota Indian proverb. When a man moves away from nature, his heart becomes hard, excuse me. Do you have a solid heart? Do you feel pain? Do you pray like natives without praying for death? Walk on the footprints of the lost tears. Can you breathe the air of the underground? Smell the good taste of freedom. Crawl your way through blood, sweat, tears. Can you taste the salt? that stream from our eyes as we try to puddle them to clean the, the streets with tear gas. Do you hear the riot? Or are your ears too filled with your own greed to, with your own greed to feel the rumble in our bellies? Can you imagine how life among the terror fields? Can you once live without deception? Can you cast away the demons of the blanket of Christianity? Though we walk through the shadows of death, we feel no evil. But we always die at the hands in the war that we can't win. Can you even cry for us? We close our eyes and hope that real humanity isn't lost. We are hungry, tired of feasting on the crumbs we've grown so familiar with, told us it's food for our souls. Guess that's why we never can eat. That's Guess that's why you, ne you never see us eat with them, never seeing us stop together, even seeing your children slain, how we slain. Do you only view us through your television? See just the hidden fences and our achievements. Guess you lump us all together. Never see the human in our kind. Make America great again. Sounds like humanity doesn't exist here. Sounds like ethno state. Sounds like immigrants better climb that wall. Sounds like win back the White House. Get that black smudge off the white doors, off these white walls, off the white halls. Sounds like alternative rights for whites. Sounds like America isn't so tan after all. Cherokee Indian proverb. When a, when a white man discovered this country, Indians were running it. No taxes, no debt. Women did all the work. Do you want to improve a system like this? What do you think can be better? Patriot hand gestures always seem to bring back the hate. Make America great again. What do you make? If America doesn't have a heart, if America doesn't want to open up its doors, if great again only will bring sorrow to others, excuse me, can you answer these questions, Mr. President? Yo, thank thank you. you, Greg. Thank you. Excellent. So, all right. so that was Greg Gregory Maurice. He's a poet. Uh, he's also one half of uh, CG. It's a GC, no CG Design Studio. GC uh, Studio. Yep, yep. Oh, yo, yo. That's right. Thank you. Thank you very much. And so you can check him out. You can look him up. Uh, yo, real quick, Greg. Uh, while you're still on, uh, how can people find you? 
Yeah, you can find me on uh, Instagram, Gregory Maurice Words. Gregory Maurice Words, all one thing. Um, and then Facebook is uh, Greg Harris. Um, and then Twitter is uh, Greg Gregory Maurice Words. Uh, so, yeah, definitely look me up, man. Excellent. Thank you again, Greg. Do appreciate you coming through. Uh, and, and we also want to thank University City Library. I believe that Lindsay is going to it's going to come back on maybe to close this out, but we want to thank University City Library. We want uh, to, you know, for partnering with us to bring some voices uh, from throughout the African diaspora, but specifically some voices that can uh, speak to what it means to be Black in America today, the Black experience. And so we're, we're again, thankful for the platform, thankful for the opportunity. Uh, and again, I want to thank Kaylin for being a part of tonight. I want to thank Grace for being a part of tonight. Sahara, Gregory, it's been it's been wonderful. So uh, so hopefully all of you had a chance to fill in, and I believe that this will be available for people to check out again if uh, if they so choose. But again, this has uh, been a wonderful experience. So thank you again, Lindsay. Thank you so much, Kaylin, Grace, Sahara, Gregory, MK. Um, I really just uh, cannot say how thankful, how inspired. I You couldn't hear me, but I was sniffing my fingers as you all were reading. Um, I am just so thrilled that you were all able to share your voices with us tonight. Um, be sure to check out herbarts.org. And um, hopefully too, once this pandemic cools down a bit, uh, it's a great space as well. Um, you'll be able to view this video on Facebook and YouTube. We've had some great comments so far. So um, I hope you all have had as much of, a, of a, an inspiring evening as uh, we have tonight. Thank you so much again, and we'll all see you soon. Bye-bye.